Hi, I'm Brady Forrest. Welcome to Ignite. Uh, we're going to have a fun hour for you to kind of cap off your day here at Google I.O. It's going to be unlike any other session that you are in, in that it is not heavily scripted. It is a bunch of people coming together that share their ideas and passions. As mentioned, I'm Brady Forrest. I'm with O'Reilly. And many, many years ago, I start now many years ago, I started Ignite. Uh, I also O'Reilly Radar and do a bunch of other conferences. And about three years ago, my friend Bree Pettis and I wanted a geek event for our friends in Seattle. And we wanted a place where they could share their thoughts and passions, but very quickly, because not everybody is that interesting. And so to do that, we set some constraints around it. But we wanted to make it a safe place for them to do that. We wanted to make it fun for the audience. And so along those lines, we invented a torturous format. And we would ply the speakers with beer. We would ply the audience with beer. I apologize in advance. Sorry. Uh, we were unable to procure any for this session. But each speaker gets just 20 slides, 15 seconds a slide, for a total of five minutes. The speakers are not in control of their slides the entire time. So once they're up here, as you've seen me do, uh, they kind of tap dance as their slides change. And in this case, we have 10 talks. We're going to be beginning with Clay Johnson, learning about the ins and outs of DC. And we're going to be ending with Where the Hell is Matt? And a little dance around the world, or a great dance around the world. If you want to tweet about it, share your thoughts on it, look up information about this later, use the hashtag IgniteIO. Uh, I won't be checking Twitter during this, so I'll be too busy hoping that PowerPoint doesn't crash, just so you know. If you've never heard of Ignite, Ignite's in over 100 cities around the world. It's spread far, it's spread wide. And if you want to throw your own, just let me know. Uh, there are a thousand of Ignite videos up online at igniteshow.com. And it is super easy and fun to start. You would really just need a bar, a microphone, and about 20 geeks, which I'm sure anyone here could round up. Now I'd like to welcome up our first speaker. He is based in DC. He's one of the people charged with basically trying to make our government more transparent. He does this through Sunlight Labs. Uh, please welcome up their CTO, Clay Johnson. How are you guys doing? No, 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 come on. This is Ignite. This is Ignite. That's what I'm talking about. I'm Clay Johnson. I direct Sunlight Labs at the Sunlight Foundation. My primary job is fighting zombies. Uh, I fight zombies in Washington, D.C., where a lot of them get created. Um, and, uh, you know, we work with government data, and I need your help to fight these zombies, too. Zombies, for the most part, uh, are being generated by bad information and bad access to information, generally by people like this. This is Glenn Beck, uh, and he's a zombie producer. Also, Keith Olbermann, in the interest of partisanship, is, is also a zombie producer, and other people who produce really bad commercial information. It's like commercially processed food. This is Tyson's Anytizers. They're dipping twists, good for any time. And I don't know what the fuck they're made out of, man. <laughs> and it's the same thing with information. If you think about it, information and food are pretty similar. They have these food chains, right? So food goes from, information, from organic matter to vegetables to meats to people. And facts go to you know, data to wire services to bloggers and distributors to people. At the top of both of these food chains are zombies. And that's what we have to fix. So what I do is I fight zombies. Uh, what we do is we get data out of government to empower people. Oh, here's a good example of some zombies. Uh, don't steal m from Medicare to support socialized medicine. It's the equivalent of people saying, brains, brains. So we take this data, right? This is every campaign contribution, not everyone, but this is a COBOL-based file of every campaign contribution uh, that every member of Congress has ever received, and we make it so that people can easily say that, hey, maybe our healthcare system is messed up because of 
campaign contributions and lobbyists and stuff like that, right? So this is transparencydata.com where you can easily sort of get all of Ben Nelson's campaign contributions at the state or federal level, level at, over the past 30 years, and you can get a nice API. You can even do cool things with it like integrate it with Gmail so you can see uh, who is contributing based on, you know, it does a lookup for, for uh, the sender of the email, so you can be like, oh, that person's a, it also checks for a lobbyist, so you can be aware of registered federal lobbyists e emailing you. So in 4000 BC, writing was a trade secret of a professional scribe. It was locked up uh, and not given to people. And I think something interesting and has, has changed now, instead of writing, it's truth is a trade secret of professional scribes. And it's up to developers to really bust down that barrier because we have the power to change Washington, D.C. through giving people better access to the truth. Now, these are our current truth tellers. They're called bloggers. And, uh, oh, well, on the left you have a blogger. Next to the blogger you have a social media expert. And then um, you have a marketing consultant and then some dude who got poisoned with LSD or something like that. Um, so, uh, but developers uh, can tell the truth through code. They can start using data to give people better access to the truth and build tools like transparency data or tools on top of transparency data to give people access to sane, rational thought. You can go to this website here, the National Data Catalog, and say, hey, maybe a mine exploded and you wanted to see the mine safety records of all of the United States. You can get that data right here and start saying, hey, maybe Massey Energy isn't doing well by its employees and is killing its, employ its, uh, its employees. You can do the same thing with, uh, let's say there's an oil spill. You can see where people are getting their oil from and how much foreign oil we are actually dependent on. And then you can start tying all this data together. This is a website that uh, one of our grantees built called Little Sis uh, that allows people to uh, tie all this data together and build profiles, a mandatory Facebook of influential people. It's pretty awesome. Uh, so. That's a zombie. Um, so, this, so these tools help you fight these people and make it so that your arms don't get chewed off by a pretty blue-eyed zombie. Um, so one last thing, fighting zombies makes you money. Uh, GPS, weather, uh, all kinds of data initiatives have uh, coming from government have created massive economies, massive industries. Uh, and this isn't just a social cause, it's something much more significant than that. So thank you very much, you guys have been great. Uh, let's hear it for Brady. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clay. And now we're gonna move away from DC and all the way back to Mountain View and Seattle with a former Googler, the woman behind the original Webmaster Central. Please welcome up Vanessa Fox. A seeker of truth. Thank you, Brady. So normally we have these things in a pub and you're all drunk and it's awesome and I'm so much better. But so since we're not in a pub today, we're going to find out the meaning of life. Uh, I checked Google first, the meaning of life. Of course, they say it's 42, which used to be really awesome. But now with the movie coming out, you know, a few years ago, everyone knows the answer is 42. If you do the Flickr search, you see that it's old hat. So we're not cool anymore to really know that the answer is 42. Oh, but they also think the meaning of life is Google. So that scared me. So I thought I would look for the meaning of life on Bing, because it's the decision engine. Sorry, Google. Um, <laughs> they told me I should look for what's my dragon name, which led me to a site to find a dragon name for my dog, horse, cat, or child. That was very disturbing. I thought perhaps instead I would try Yahoo, um, another search engine. It told me to find the meaning of life on these three places in this order. Uh, <laughs> And the Bible's the only one in lowercase, which I didn't know exactly what that meant. So I went to Twitter first, and it actually pointed me to Facebook. Um, so I thought, okay. And uh, the meaning of life is Robert Pattinson looks like a foot of um, Twilight fame. I didn't think this was really leading me in the direction I had been looking for. So I thought I'd do another search on Facebook, what's the meaning of life. It told me to go to YouTube. Back to Google, right? The number two search engine is YouTube. This is what YouTube said the meaning of life was. Um, this actually disturbed me maybe just as much as Robert Pattinson is, looks like a foot. So I didn't learn the meaning of life, but what I did learn was that people are crazy on the internet. 
And I was like, okay, maybe I'm just looking at the wrong thing. Maybe I just really need to know, now find out why are people on the internet so crazy? So this was the next search that I did. And uh, what I found was that this, I do a search on a serious subject, and what I found find is that the author would like to shoot the Pope or would like to do strange things to my unmentionable parts. And also, by the way, why do all the, all the crazy people use the caps button? And these things seem to be of equal um, interest to this person. So I thought, oh, well, that's a good question. So why do crazy people use caps on the Internet? And what I found was... <laughs> does anyone have a good recipe for red velvet cake? And I was like, yeah, dude, I love cake. So let's, I ended up on this site, which was a bunch of people in a flame war about whether the Star Trek characters should really be on the cake because really was he a navigator? And it ended up with this guy saying, have you kissed a girl? Turn off caps lock on your computer. So I thought, okay, I'm going to really go to the root of crazy people and ask them what the meaning of life is, which of course led me to chat roulette. But then, then I looked into chat roulette and I was like, you know what, I'm not going there after all. I don't need to know the meaning of life that, that bad. So instead, that validated that people on the internet are crazy. But also, the other thing, of course, is that we all search, right? You all have been searching and you found that people want to do things to your unmentionable parts. Yeah, so we do 2.9 million searches a minute. And uh, we use major search engines for everything. 71% of us use major search engines for looking for health information. So life or death, are we gonna live, are we gonna die? And we're doing searches with all of those crazy people on chat roulette, and this is how we're getting our information. Um, the same is true with government information. A study just found that search engines was how we get our government data uh, that apparently cause us to be zombies. So that's a little bit scary. Uh, we used to use the library to get information, um, but it turns out that these days, that only 13% of people use the library as a place to find information. 58% use it to look for reference books, except 65% use it to go on the internet where all the crazy people are. <laughs> so there is a Slate article that talked about this that we really like to seek and search, and when we do that, it causes the chemicals in our brain to mimic the state that we're in when we're on cocaine. And so that causes us just to keep searching more and more. Sort of that's how I ended up um, seeing the cat crazy guy. So apparently when you search, this is what happens. So this is kind of how that article ended. If humans are seeking machines, we've created the perfect machines to allow us to seek endlessly. So what does that mean, right? So some other experts have looked into it and said, okay, we don't get really good search results, but the reason we don't is because most of the queries we do are a single word, so it's our own fault. It's all your guys' fault. You ended up with the crazy people because you just didn't know how to search correctly. Some other people are like, well, maybe that's not the problem. Maybe it's just that there's so much information out there. There's not a good way to catalog it, and we think if it's popular or in the top 10 search results, it must be accurate, which isn't true. So what should we do with this? So I would say this, um, when we search, it's like we're on drugs, so therefore we're not going to stop. Um, we're gonna keep doing it more and more, and yet what we're ending up with is a world full of crazy people. So what does that mean for the future of how we interact with information? Thank you. Awesome, Vanessa, thank you. And we're lucky to have our next speaker here because he was almost eaten over the North Atlantic. Please welcome Bradley Vickers. I'm gonna talk about rowing across the North Atlantic Ocean from New York to Falmouth, England. It's a journey of about 3,200 nautical miles and I completed it in about 71 days, just over 71 days with my three other teammates. And we were recognized by Guinness World Records of ha as having had the first landfall to landfall crossing of the North Atlantic Ocean. And I think that you can take some, hopefully, observations from this crossing and apply them to whatever projects you guys might be involved with. The actual <laughs> expedition took about 18 months to prepare for, and part of that was getting our team together. The four of us had rowed together in college, and we figured, why not? Let's row across an ocean. We also had to outfit our 29 by 6 foot ocean rowboat with a solar panel that fueled our communications and our navigation systems. And it also powered our desalinator, which converted salt water into fresh water. Now, the actual crossing is both a mental and a physical challenge. As you can see from the slide behind me, 
the transformation, both physically and mentally, that I underwent. That last one, I'm losing it. Get me to shore. <laughs> Part of the physical nature of this is we were rowing in shifts of two hours. Two hours on, two hours off. Two on, two off. Two on, two off. 24 hours a day, someone's at the oars for 12 of those. So we're continually sleep deprived. You can see Jordan there in the corner sleeping with the one eye open in the cabin. It's a very cramped cabin. It's about eight foot by five foot. So you're never getting full rest. You're also having to keep yourself clean and your clothing because you don't want to get saltwater sores. And we were downloading satellite images of the North Atlantic and weather reports and uploading our blog via Iridium satellite phone. So we need to eat. We also need to eat during our two hours off. And we had budgeted between eight, sorry, seven and 8,000 calories per rower per day, which is an immense amount of food. I was in charge of planning the food, and I miscalculated, <laughs> which is not a fun thing to tell your teammates. In fact, over the, I, I realized it on day 14, and it took me until day 17 that I worked up the courage to tell my teammates. We would lose a combined 137 pounds. I lost 28, Dylan 32, Jordan 35, and Greg 42 pounds. Now ultimately, we were successful in achieving our goal, which was rowing across the North Atlantic without physical assistance, so we couldn't be resupplied by food. We achieved that, and I think the outlook that we had and the process we went through can be applied to getting through challenging settings with a group of people in, in a team dynamic. We were on a 29 by six foot boat and we couldn't get off. So we had to work together. One of the ways that we worked together is we had conversations for the boat and we had conversations for land. If it was constructive, if it was productive, it was for the boat. If it was destructive or if we're trying to find out whose fault it was, mainly mine, <laughs> it was for land, hopefully over a large warm meal and multiple cold beverages. So we kept ourselves focused on solution-based su suggestions. The other thing is our process. Immediately on realizing that we were short on food, we inventoried the entire boat so we could start dealing with some facts and some numbers. And we realized that if we rationed, we could make it to England. So we had a plan. And when we had that plan, we had something to focus our efforts and our energies towards rather than bickering amongst ourselves. And we made progress towards our goal. And with, with that plan, we learned more information. We learned how we responded to the low calorie intake. And we constantly readjusted our plan, but our goal remained a constant. And I think that's huge when you're working on a project don't shift your goal to meet the settings that you find yourselves in. Constantly adjust your plan and your own actions that you're taking to achieve that goal. I've really enjoyed sharing my experience with all of you, and I hope that you're able to take these stories and apply them to whatever pursuit, pursuits that you're in, whether personal, professional, whatever passions they are. I wish you the best of luck in achieving your own adventures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bradley. Uh, as I mentioned, there are Ignites around the world, and we're lucky to have the organizer of the Community Leadership Summit Ignite here, and he does a lot of work with helping people get together communities, build communities, and keep them together, and he's here to share some of his secrets. Please welcome Van Riper. Uh, just to be clear, I'm not a community serial organizer. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I'm here to talk to you today about my work as a serial community organizer. I know, bad joke. You're supposed to be drinking. These are some of my communities. <laughs> the bird is Juggy, the Jugs community mascot. Jug stands for Java user groups. Probably not what some of you were thinking. I did create this Yahoo group for a production of Hello Dolly. The theater director of my daughter's show did say to me, 
So I see you are a community organizer. Shortly after that, my career as a community organizer really began. At Bay Kai, I helped others organize their own small communities for more than a decade. I also learned the importance of regular in-person meetings to build communities. Oh yeah, the lady in the lower left, she's taken. She's my wife, Mary Van Riper. The Silicon Valley Web Jug was the first community that I started. I escaped the imploding startup world for a safe haven at VeriSign. The pay was good, but the legacy code work was killing me. For fun, I would hang out with other Java developers at my jug. Java, 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 jing, jing, jing. These folks are my Java posse. In particular, Aaron Houston in the baseball cap played a pivotal role in my efforts as a community organizer with the Jugs and the Java Champions communities. In 2006, I came close to burning out. If Kevin had not come along, are you here, Kevin? Uh, all right. Uh, if he had not come along and played it, bat, Robin to my Batman, um, you know, who knows what would have happened. But it quickly evolved into a relationship of equals. Uh, these uh, global maps were all created by me in KML. And maps, maps like these are a great way to support a global community. Uh, one of these is not like the others, and you'll have to ask Brady why that is. Uh, sorry, Silicon Valley Code Camp is a free annual event put on by developers for developers. That lunch line had a thousand hungry, develop, uh, hungry developers in it. We gave out almost 200 large pizzas that day, and it's already open for registration. Uh, th this sh shirt is showing uh, the tag cloud of the most recent Code Camp, and Peter Keller and Tammy Baker are the original organizers, and I help them now. And, you can see how Java has become a big part of last year's camp. Chris Schalk uh, is actually uh, behind the start of the Google Technology User Groups. And we had our first meeting in January of 2008. Stephanie Liu and Jason Cooper are our current sponsors and look for the GTUG camp out this summer. Uh, when, whether you are looking for a GTUG near you or you want to start a new group, you should come check out the GTUG lounge here at I.O. Uh, that's where you'll find people like me hanging out during the breaks. And please do visit gtugs.org online. Organizing developer communities is fun, but I needed something more. I attended the first community leadership summit in the summer of 2009. I was swimming in a sea of community organizers. That event was a natural high for someone like me. John O'Bacon, the author of The Art of Community, organized the first CLS. He believes in building family values in your communities through events. With Marcy Hennon egging me on, I decided to put this into practice by organizing the first regional CLS event. Thus, CLS West, in January of 2010, came to pass. Irene Kohler found us a great venue. Dave Nielsen and Suda Jamthi were our fundraisers extraordinaire. Kalia did her magic running the unconference, and Sonia Berry did an amazing job handling the food. It's hard to believe, but the second edition of the main CLS event is only two months away and I've been asked to help organize it. I've somehow become an organizer of community organizers. If you do community work, you have to be there. I was a MAP volunteer for Global Ignite Week. It inspired me to plan something similar for the CLS movement in 2011. On this stage, I'm officially announcing plans for a regional CLS month next January, and you could be a part of it. See me to find out more. People often ask how I can put so much effort into these volunteer activities. I did start out to scratch my own itch, but I soon found it was enriching my life. Brian Sharp has some concrete practices that will make you a better leader and a better person. Google has some great community technologies, but technology doesn't build communities. People build communities. Spend time getting to know people here. Don't just soak up the technology. Even for geeks like us, it is still about the people whose lives we have touched. I like fortune cookies. The next time you open one, add in community leadership to the end of your fortune. It's not as titillating as the traditional game, but you might be surprised by the result. That's all, folks. Thank you very much, Van. Yeah, I met Van when he was helping out with Global Ignite Week. Uh, thanks again. Our next speaker I met just two weeks ago, a week and a half ago. She is on a Knight Rider, Knight Ritter uh, scholarship uh, to research journalism. And she's trying to figure out how to tell stories through locative media. And it seemed to me that the home of Google Maps might just be the perfect place for her to tell her story. Please welcome Chrissy Clark.
Hello. My name's Chrissy Clark, and I make documentaries for public radio, but don't worry, I am not going to ask you for money right now. Um, I'm going to tell you about a vision that I had in the desert. But to understand that vi vi vision, you need to know a little bit about me. I am a fifth generation Californian. My great great grandfather came to the Bay Area in 1848 on a mule. And the legacy of that is that as a kid, when I was growing up, I heard a lot of stories from my dad about the world that I was driving through all the time. So he would point at things and he would say, that used to be that. That industrial wind farm used to be our family's general store. Or that big eight lane freeway that goes up onto the Golden Gate Bridge that you see as you're approaching, that used to be my dad's personal jungle gym. He claims to have climbed it when the bridge was under construction. I don't know if I believe that, but what I did learn through all of that was that a landscape is made out of stories. It's sort of layers and layers of stories, like geologic strata. And that is what inspired me to become a radio reporter. I started moving around the world and asking questions about how places got to be the way that they were. So one of those questions was bad neighborhoods. We've all been through bad neighborhoods or avoided them. Why are they the way that they are? How did they get to be that way? I asked that question about a neighborhood in San Francisco um, in the Western edition, and it turns out that that neighborhood would not, was not always a bad neighborhood. In fact, it used to be in the 1940s a cultural mecca for the African-American community. It was called the Harlem of the West. But in the 1960s, uh, it was a target for urban redevelopment. And so there were 13,000 families that were moved out of San Francisco. Um, a lot of buildings were raised, and voila, you get a bad neighborhood. Another question I started asking about the landscape in San Francisco was, why is this city gay? Like, why of all of the cities in the world is San Francisco gay? And so it actually has a lot to do with this building up here, which is 710 Montgomery Street. It's now a kind of yuppie tapas restaurant. But in the 1940s, it was a cafe called the Black Cat Cafe. And a guy named Jose Saria would come and dress in drag, these lovely uh, black evening gowns, and sing songs about his life as a homosexual male. They were flamboyant and funny and provocative and political, and people started flocking to them. And the reason that they, he didn't get kicked out of that bar, as he would have in most other parts of the country at that time, is that San Francisco, it wasn't that it was so liberal, but it actually, it was a loophole in a post-prohibition way that uh, bars are regulated. In most parts of the country, bars are regulated by morality police, or were back then. But uh, in San Francisco, bars were regulated by tax collectors. And so they just wanted to get money. They didn't care what was going on in them. And voila, the gay rights movement was born in San Francisco. So these sorts of stories were on my mind as I was driving through a desert in Utah a couple of years ago. And I saw this cabin. And I had this urge. I wanted to know the stories about this cabin because I was out in the middle of nowhere. Why the hell was this cabin here? And I wanted to click on that cabin. Like you would click on a hyperlink. I just, maybe I'd been in front of a computer for too long. And I know that was a delirious idea back then, but as you know, it is not a delirious idea anymore, thanks to many of you in this room. You can click on the world. You can, clip on, you can click on the world and get information. So if we're driving through uh, the Utah desert right now and we clicked on this cabin, what kind of information would we get? Well, we'd get some cool Wikipedia articles. We'd be told that it is a desert, which we kind of already knew. We would also get some Yelp restaurant reviews, maybe some other bits of sort of drips and drabs from the internet. And that stuff is amazing, mind-blowing. My great-great-grandfather would be amazed. But one of the things that we aren't getting yet is stories, sto sort of the personal dramas, the economic policies, the environmental issues, the political struggles that make a place what it is and shapes the people who live there. It's sort of getting the meaning onto the landscape. And as a journalist, those are the sorts of stories that I tell all of the time. And there are actually thousands and thousands of archives of those sorts of stories that are locked up right now and don't really have a home out in the world. And so what I'm interested in doing is getting those stories, those archives, onto the world so that we can click on them. So say we're driving through Utah, we see that cabin. Maybe we click on it and we find out, and this is true, I researched it, that it, that cabin happens to be as desolate as it is in one of the uh, counties that has the highest job growth in the country over the last 10 years. Or we find out that it was a place where a radioactive waste 
facility is about to be built. So it's those sorts of stories, not just in Utah, but all over the country, all over the world, that I'm interested in putting onto the landscape. And if you want to talk to me about that, please do. My email was there. You can click on me. Thanks. She didn't know what Ignite was a week ago. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is a digital artist, and I think it's best to just say he makes beautiful things through code. Please welcome up Aaron Koblen. Thanks. Hey. Okay, so in addition to being a technology lead of Google's Creative Lab, I also have a passion for making data, or art with large data sets and large groups of people on the internet. So I'm going to try to breeze through really quickly a few of the projects I've been working on recently, uh, particularly crowdsourcing based projects. So projects um, Okay, so some of you may be familiar with this. This is Baron Wolfgang von Kempelen's mechanical chess playing machine. This is actually a robotic chess player, except for the fact that it's not at all. There's a legless guy who sits in a box and he controls this thing, acting like he's a machine. And I, I thought this was a particularly bizarre story, especially because Amazon created a web service based off this that some of you may be familiar with called the Mechanical Turk. And this uses basically the premise that there's certain things that are easy for people but hard for machines. And now you can, ha you can farm out these tasks to a large number of people. Uh, and they can do these little things in complete isolation from one another, and they call it artificial, artificial intelligence. <laughs> so it's a really weird concept. There's like thousands of people, and none of them have any idea what they're doing, but you can ask them to do anything. So I thought, what can I do, and how can I experiment with the system? So I decided to make a first project where I asked them to draw sheep facing to the left, and I said, I'll pay you two cents for this task. And it's a little, very simple drawing tool. It has a size slider and a gray slider, and you can start drawing away at your sheep. And I started collecting sheep a large number of sheep. Um, these are a few of the sheep that I collected. And you can see kind of a really interesting juxtaposition. You have this very mechanized, huge system and all of these individuals. I also captured the drawing process of each individual sheep. So I'm going to rattle off a bunch of URLs. Hopefully, maybe some of you will get to check them later. The sheepmarket.com, you can see where all of these sheep, how they were drawn. And you can actually purchase them, which is another interesting topic. Uh, you can. <laughs> But uh, I, don't, I don't know if I even have time to get into that in the Ignite. But you can browse through them all, see them all. Uh, and it's individual, individual. so here's some stats from the project. There's uh, about 11 sheep per hour were coming in over 40 days. There are 662 sheep that didn't meet sheep-like criteria and were thrown out of the, out of the mix. Uh, there were 7,599 unique IP addresses. So that gives you an idea of about how many people participated. But only one of them asked this, just one. <laughs> Uh, it's a really valid question. I, I, the, I, I really expected a lot more of that, and there's a lot of reasons that I had people drawing sheep. Reference to cloning, reference to uh, labor. I don't have time to get into it. This is another project. Uh, I took a frame from Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times. On the left side, you have uh, the frame then divided by, uh, into 16 pieces, individual people drawing different portions for five cents. Amazing dedication was kind of going to these tasks. And th this is a, a sample from a project I worked on with my friend Takashi Kawashima, which was kind of based off this notion where you give somebody something and they recreate what they see without knowing what it is that they're working on. And we decided to take it quite literally what the Mechanical Turk was used for, which is making money. And we created a $100 bill. We paid the workers the literal value of their contribution. So that's one cent for 10,000 people making this massive forgery. What you see here is everybody's contribution. So if they drew a smiley face, it's in there. If they actually did what they were asked to do, it's also there. So you can get a sense of what's going on. Really don't have time to talk about this one, but if you get a chance, bicyclebuiltfor2000.com. It's the audio version of this, where I worked with my friend Daniel Massey, and we collected sound samples and did a granular synthesis of the song Bicycle Built for 2000, where you can hear individual people making tones, emulating tones to make the song. Another audio-based project that I got to work with, uh, I got to work with Radiohead, one of my favorite bands, uh, and director James Frost, and we shot this video um, using laser scanners as 3D data. Um, and we made a music video without video. Um, what you're looking at is Tom York's face. We basically then released it as an open source project on Google Code, and we allowed people to download some source code to play with the data, uh, and also the data itself, uh, and, and people started making their own versions. This is probably my favorite part of this project, the fact that it really started to create a community of people making interesting content. And you see here on the bottom left uh, the pinboard version of, the t of Tom York singing. There's a Lego version. In the center there's somebody who actually 3D printed Tom York's face. So now there's this physical manifestation of it as well. And I thought this was really exciting that there, there were people 
working together, and they knew what they were doing, and I thought, let's do something like that. That led to this project, Johnny Cash Project, which we just launched. Uh, this is uh, Johnny Cash's last album, making a music video for uh, the song Ain't No Grave Can Hold My Body Down. And we're actually kind of resurrecting, director Chris Milk and I, resurrecting Johnny Cash through individual users' drawings. So what you can see here, none of these are photographs. Uh, they're hand-drawn frames that people can contribute to make this music video that's constantly changing. So it's not just a single video, but there's actually different tracks uh, and different, uh, a community building around it, rating and judging. Um, this is Gray Area Foundation for the Arts. I wanted to do a quick call out. Uh, here in San Francisco, it, we have workshops. Um, it, it basically lead different types of thinkers to use programming and other tools uh, and get artists and designers and people kind of using technology in interesting ways. One of the things we talk about a lot is this tool called processing, which is basically a series of libraries in Java, which makes it really easy for artists and designers and people who aren't necessarily familiar with Java or programming to start uh, doing creative coding. Um, I highly recommend you check it out. Finally, last but definitely not least, I want to mention Chrome Experiments, which is a website I helped launch at Google, which is showing a bunch of the uh, really interesting HTML5 and JavaScript hacks and demos. So uh, some of the stuff you may have not realized you could do in a browser. And it, since you're all developers, I would love for you to check it out and also contribute if you had a chance. Thanks very much. Thank you, Aaron. Now, who, who loved the animation behind the speakers this morning with the wires that create Google? You can thank him for that as well. And his team, and his team. Uh, now, as you may guess, we're about to talk about someone else's hobby. Uh, the physical manifestation of You Sunk My Battleship. Please welcome James Young. Thank you. Model warship combat is taking World War I, World War II battleships and building 144th scale models of them, arming them with working BB guns, and going to a pond and just shooting the crap out of each other. <laughs> <clears throat> the, the, it, it's a game. It's a game we play, and like all games, it's got rules, and everybody has to obey the rules for the game to be fun. These are the rules for the various formats, and it's kind of like Mac versus Linux versus Windows. You, you take your pick and you stick with your, your religion. Um, big gun is, is, in my opinion, the most fun. You get to have quarter-inch ball bearings. You, you fire everything, you man everything, you do everything as much to scale as you possibly can. And, and that's what these, these boats are. Uh, the guns can be really complex, from rotating, depressing turrets, to really simple guns that fire as fast as you possibly can. Uh, and, and they're all CO2 powered and they run quite well. You're gonna start with original ships. They have to be ships that were really laid down or built in World War I, World War II. This is the Cleveland in that corner. This is the Rodney from the UK. Um, you're gonna learn about the people that served on them and it's really fascinating to find out the history of these ships. And you can pick whatever kind of ship you want, aircraft carrier, submarine. Battleships are the easiest to do. You've got the most space, there's room to work with. There's, there's room to put all of your guns and do everything that you want to do with it. You can find plans online. A lot of people in the hobby make plans for these ships. Or you can go straight to the Library of Congress, get the original plans from the Navy, scale them down to 144th scale, and, and build it yourself. You can buy fiberglass holes online, or you can, if you're good with woodworking skills, you can make it yourself. You're kind of making a framework to lay a thin layer of balsa wood around the ship and that balsa was what you're shooting and, and how it sinks and takes damage. Um, you can go really detailed. This is a fine example. This is the Yamoto here. Yeah, I got that right. On the, on the right. Or you can be really simple like mine and, and like the other one up there. It really just depends on how much time and skill that you have to dedicate to the hobby. And it's, it's really about money and time. For, people say, how much, how much does it cost? And I'm like, well, anywhere from like $500 to $2,000. It really just depends on how much skill you can put into one and how much you just want to buy from somebody else that's done the work for you. Once you've got your ship, once it's all ready, you can, you know, you go to the pond, you put it on the pond with everybody else, and you have battles. And the, you know, they usually have an objective. So every, you know, the Axis team has to get their transports across the pond and back across the pond without sinking, or the Allies have to you know, accomplish some goal without, without being destroyed. Or maybe it's just a deathmatch style battle and everybody just goes out there and tries to sink everybody else, and the last man on the, pond, on the top of the pond wins the game. Um, but they're really shooting BBs, they're, they're really 
really doing damage to each other. So stuff's going to get shot off your ship. You're going to have holes punched inside of your ship. And you've got bilge pumps. You can see the spray on that one up there where the bilge pump is spraying up. And you're going to sink. And it's part of the game. Everybody sinks. It kind of sucks. You could get sunk. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it, that's, that's what you're out there for is to sink and to be sunk. So the ships are all designed. You waterproof as much as you can. Uh, you've got protection around your electronics. So you just pull your boat out of the water. You patch the holes on it. Uh, put it back on the pond. And 15 minutes later, you're ready to fight another battle. Uh, the kind of damage you can take can be pretty severe. Um, I've got some pictures right there of, of the damage that you'll take. It's not, it's not small. You're really getting your boat shot to pieces. And, and so to repair it, you can either put just masking tape over it for real temporary repair. Um, there's a, a really thin cloth that's impregnated with glue, glue that you can put on there. And in the wintertime, when the, when the ponds are all frozen over, you just peel off your balsa wood and, and put new balsa wood on there. There are clubs that do this all over the world, from Australia to England. You know, in the United States, there's, there's clubs in almost every region of the, of the country. I'm from Utah, and I'm a Navy of one. I, it's just me. So if anybody here is from Utah, then, then give me a call, and we'll, we'll, I'll bring you out. Who's here from the Bay Area? Give me a shout. Okay, these are your people. These guys are in San Jose, and they're, all, they're from all around the Bay Area. And we'll be at Maker's Fair this weekend, and we'll have a huge battle, battle at Maker's Fair. So come out to Maker's Fair. RC Naval Combat is the place you want to go. This is where we all talk online. And this is my contact info. I love to talk about this hobby. I have to say thank you to my wife and to my best friend, Sam Roskelly, who made this hobby possible. Thank you very much. So, James, we normally don't have time for questions, but I just have to ask, how many eyes do you lose a year? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker uh, has been experimenting with Wave from the beginning and has made an homage to what I can only assume is Buffy the Vampire Slayer with uh, the Eliza bot. Please welcome Ann Veiling. Thank you. I'd like to share with you a little adventure I've had with Google Wave over the past year. Let me ask you a question. Who was here at I.O. last year? There's hands. It was great. I was, I was here too, and I was excited to meet so many smart people, just like today. I was also excited to, meet, to, uh, to hear about Google Wave. And even though a year later, Google Wave may not have been the overnight success that we may have hoped for, um, I still strongly believe in the vision behind Google Wave. Because instead of us juggling around the objects between the people they need to collaborate and sending it back and forth, Google Wave actually turns that model upside down and has all these people uh, collaborate and go towards the wave and move towards the object, uh, collaborate on that. I also like Wave because of the protocol, so the technology. And as I'm a nerd, what's the best way to find out? Excel programming. So when I came home last year, it's what I did. I thought, let's create a Google Wave robot. And as I have a background in artificial intelligence, I thought, let's create Eliza. If you don't know Eliza, created by Professor Weizenbaum in 1966 already. It's a simple pattern recognition script that looks for certain words in your, what you're typing, juggles them around, and creates questions back, just like a shrink would do, right? Only a shrink would charge you money, and Eliza is for free. So I, I looked up on the internet, I got an open source Eliza script and played around with it just a week after I.O. I used Google Wave Robot API, App Engine, which I'd never used before, um, and I used the Eli this Eliza. I grouped it all together. Two hours later, I had this Eliza bot just for myself. And it worked. And I was, I was happy. Uh, yeah. This is her name, ElizaRobot.AppSpot.com. Feel free. Feel free to use her. Uh, you can confide in her. Uh, she has a doctor-patient confidentiality, so she has nothing to say. Um, so later, later do this. So I, I chatted with her, had fun, I learned a lot about Google Wave, uh, blogged about it, and I thought that's where the story ended. To my big surprise, what happened is she got enormous amount of attention. I believe I was the first person outside of Google to create a Google Wave robot. And a lot of people would start chatting with her, inviting me to waves with her, uh, there's YouTube fan videos of her. Uh, 
it's amazing, right? But as always, there's also a dark side, right? Because what would happen is that one person, one funny guy, would add Eliza to a public wave. <laughs> yeah. And, and because of the scalability of App Engine and the Google Wave robot, all of these Elizas would respond to everybody at the same time immediately, <laughs> right? It was amazing. And remember, in those days, you could not throw somebody out of a wave, right? <laughs> so Google had to create this little robot, Bouncy, which had special, special privileges to kick somebody out, right? And it's only since last month that in Google Wave, you can actually remove a participant from a wave. And I can understand that, because it's not, it's not just about technology, it's also about how, what do you want? How do you want it to work? Right? Who is allowed to restrict access and why? What happens to the state of the person who is looking, uh, what he has already seen? Um, and all of those functional aspects are important. And how do you even know who is a robot and who is not? Right? So that's, that's quite important. I think that's one of the lessons you can learn from this type of new technology. It's become so easy nowadays to create powerful web application by meshing up all sort of different web services from different areas. How do we make sure we don't misuse that trust? How do we make sure a Google Wave robot does not copy everything you put in the wave and sends it off to somebody you don't want to be able to listen in on your wave, right? <laughs> how, how do you know? If we have an Android app, right, how do you know this Android app isn't looking at your Gmail contacts, address book, uh, apps and whatever, and does something with it that you don't want to do, that, y that you don't want, right? Who, whoever reads actually reads what's in here. It's become uh, like a software license, yes, 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 right? So I think that's one of the big challenges for us today. And I think the answer also lies in the, in the social networks themselves, because the power lies also in the strength of the networks, and you see more and more people and companies using this. I know one person who you can trust, that's Eliza, the robot shrink. Feel free tonight when you're alone in your hotel room to have a chat with her. This is her address. That's my address. Please come to me uh, uh, later if you want to talk about Eliza, have interesting stories, or if she's helped you through your depression. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we've got just two more speakers. And in case you came in late, everybody here is doing Ignite Talks. They're just five minutes long, 20 slides, 15 seconds a slide. The speakers have no control over their slides. Have pity on them. Uh, our next two speakers are pretty experienced, though, so I'm not worried about it. Uh, you may know him as the king of the cheeseburgers. Please welcome up Ben Ha. Hey guys, you may know me from such highbrow websites as Failblog, uh, I can as Cheeseburger, and one of our newer sensations, uh, very demotivational. And we run about like 50 other websites now and uh, growing on a weekly basis. So, um, and Brady has asked me to talk about the evolution of the meme, pronounced meme, which is the idea that ideas are transmitted from person to person. A meme is something that's passed on from one person to another. Uh, an, an evolution of memes have actually occurred throughout our lives, and we may not have noticed it. And I'll tell you about the definition and the rules of the meme that memes, as we know it today, are something that anybody can participate in. Right? Even this guy. Right? We don't actually control who is a part of a meme or not because everybody owns the idea. Okay? <laughs> Even that old guy and that busty chested lady and that nice sexy legs, they can all participate because everybody owns uh, what a meme is. And uh, this is part of a communal process uh, in generating things. And I don't want you to get confused about memes and viral content, all right? Memes are not the same thing as viral content. Viral content is a subset of memes. It's related in that way where a burrito is uh, related to a clogged artery. And also, it's not an internet thing, okay? This is not owned by Al Gore. Memes actually started well before the internet, and actually the, me the word meme came from a book, you know, well before the internet was ever even created. So we want to kind of delve into kind of the history of this. So I started looking back and, and I tried to figure out, you know, when did the idea of virus start? And it looked like it actually started well before uh, civilization, that once people try to figure out how things worked, um, like they developed a skill set, right? 
they could actually pass along to each other, and passing along a skill from person to person was a meme, right? And what we're trying to do here would, by building cities and figuring out God and religion is to try to create order in our world. So this is early civilization. Ideas of uh, viruses were designed to create order and structure around how we understand the universe. And now we all know, thanks to that, that you cannot just walk into mortar. And also, after we... <laughs> I'm competing with my own damn slides. All right. <laughs> I'm just going to sit here quietly and let you guys watch. So once we figured out how the world worked, and then we thought, you know, how do we use the world to liberate ourselves? How do we, how do we become free of the constraints of our physical world? So we started to publish things. We created a printing press. We uh, set scientific knowledge and scientific method as an idea that we can transmit to other people. And then we decided that advertising would set us free that we could create products and sell it to each other, and we would make our glory holes clean. <laughs> well, there was a backlash to that, and the backlash to advertising was internet culture, right? <laughs> and, and a lot of us here are fans of internet culture because we realize that internet culture is about chasing happiness, that we could in turn take mass media, turn it upside down and make our, ourselves and each other happy because we're angry at pop culture because it gave us twilight. <laughs> and if you don't notice too, those two guys, uh, those are the two main male characters in Twilight that uh, are supposed to be kissing Bella, but these hands have made them kiss each other. <laughs> the problem with pop culture is it's owner-oriented. It's one way. It's top-down. It's actually not controlled by the masses. It's actually controlled by the few people who control the, the medium that it, that it works in. But internet culture is different, right? We, ha we can enjoy this very simple photo and laugh at it and get hours of laughter out of it. You can actually progress that and put somebody else's face in it, try a different animal, Photoshop it, and actually evolve the culture because we're subversive. Thank you, Google, for this wonderful suggestion. And in fact, an entire grassroots community of people have developed around the idea that you could make fun of Google by looking at the suggested results. And because this is a limitless property that we can actually take culture, reappropriate it, and continue to grow an audience of people who enjoy subverting and sharing this culture with one another without actually owning it. And we have to use our powers for good, <laughs> right? You can't just spam your friends for Farmville gifts all the time. You have to actually think about how your subversive nature affects one another. And I would argue that this world is more about making each other happy than anything else. And to make ourselves a little bit happier, I'm, I'm going to dance on stage with Matt from Where the Hell is Matt? And uh, that's the end of my uh, presentation. And here is Matt. Okay, I realize using this here is a fail on many levels, but it's going to avert disaster, so. All right, here we go. A great circle is an imaginary line around the Earth that splits it into two equal halves. We all know the equator, but you can actually draw an infinite number of them by extending a line between any two points on the globe. Using Google Earth, I've made one that starts at Barbara Streisand's house and passes through Dick Cheney's private residence in McLean, Virginia. Continue the line all the way around, and you've got yourself a great circle. Today, I'm going to talk about another slightly more substantial great circle I call it the imaginary line of ancient cosmic weirdness. But first, a disclaimer, this is not my own research. I got obsessed with the Great Circle website by a guy named Jim Allison, and I'm basing my talk on his work. To define the imaginary line in question, I'm going to start with two very well-known ancient sites, the pyramids at Giza in Egypt and the mysterious Nazca lines on the west coast of Peru. Now that we've got our line, we're going to follow it around to see what else we run into. For over 4,000 years, the pyramids of Giza were the tallest structures ever built by man. Some believe the adjacent sphinx is even older, serving as a gateway to the afterlife for some pre-Egyptian culture. Fitting, fitting then that today you can admire it from across the street while consuming a deep dish meat lovers combo. Way out in the Sahara, the oasis of Siwa is believed to have been settled around 10,000 years ago. It was known as the Oracle of Amon-Ra in 332 BC when Alexander the Great marched 500 miles in the wrong direction to ask it if he was a god. The Oracle confirmed that he was a son of Zeus. That has nothing to do with imaginary lines, it's just awesome. <laughs> Heading east, the line follows Moses' path out of Egypt across Israel and into Jordan where we reach the city of Petra, founded by the Nabataeans in 500 BC. 
The written language that emerged out of Petra is known today as Arabic, and of course, Petra is also where Indiana Jones found the Holy Grail. Crossing Saudi Arabia and into Iraq, the line takes us to the ancient Sumerian city of Ur, one of the oldest human settlements in existence. Somewhere around 2000 BC, a guy named Abraham grew up here before wandering west and starting the Hebrew tribe. All sorts of crazy stuff happened after that, you should Google it. The line takes us into Iran, where we find Persepolis, founded by Cyrus the Great. Persepolis was the capital of the vast Persian Empire, until it was conquered by Alexander. Still coasting on his godliness, Alexander got drunk and burned the city down on a dare which is why Persians still know him today as Alexander the Douche. In Pakistan, in Pakistan, we find the remains of the Harappan city of Mahenjo-Daro, which in 2500 BC was one of the most advanced cities in the world. It thrived for a thousand years until the Harappan suddenly disappeared in an archeological puff of smoke. We don't know anything else about the Harappan people because no one could read their handwriting. The imaginary line continues into Asia, passing through ancient cities in India, Burma, Thailand, and Cambodia, which brings the tally up to 10 sites that fall within its path. The line enters the vast blue emptiness of the South Pacific Ocean, where it crosses directly through a tiny island 2,000 miles from any other land worth mentioning. That would be Easter Island, home to the Rapa Nui people who once carved hundreds of massive stone heads called Moai and scattered them all over the place for no good reason. Entering South America, we find that the city of Machu Picchu is a bit too far north of the line, but if we go south on the famous Inca Trail, we quickly reach the much larger city of Olentaytambo, which lies directly under the line's path. And finally, the last stop, the massive line drawings of the Nazca people. So large, they can only be seen from the air. They don't show up great in satellite imagery, though, so I've overlaid a clearer map. Notice how the drawings are oriented not along the north-south polar axis, but strictly parallel to the imaginary line of ancient cosmic weirdness. So what? What does this mean? Is civilization somehow drawn to or catalyzed by this particular bearing? Is the line tied to the positions of the stars? Are there undiscovered cities buried under the endless sand dunes, sand dunes of the Sahara? And I'll just go ahead and say it. Where's the lost island, of Atla lost island of Atlantis in all this? Here's my best answer. Apophenia. The tendency to see meaning in random data. Human intelligence relies on our ability to see patterns, and it's constantly delivering us false positives, which is why we see a face on Mars, <laughs> find Jesus in a potato chip, and buy into corny theories in horribly written novels. There are thousands of, thousands of ancient settlements that are nowhere near the imaginary line of ancient cosmic weirdness. The real link between the places I've shown is that they were inhabited by people with the same compulsion to ascribe meaning and importance to the random data around them in an attempt to make some sense out of life. Whew. That said, I want to throw one more thing at you. The Piri Reis map, completed in 1513 by the Turkish mariner of the same name. Drawn on the height of a gazelle, for lack of poster board, it features an accurate likeness of the South American coastline. Why is that weird? Because by 1513, no Western explorer had mapped the South American coastline. Some even claim this stretch of land on the bottom is a fairly accurate depiction of the Antarctic coast, which no one is supposed to have seen until the 1820s. The map also shows the correct distance between Africa and South America. Without a reliable way to measure longitude, maps from centuries later still got that wrong. In the margins, Peary mentioned compiling the map from 20 different sources, some dating back to the time of, here he is again, Alexander, effectively preserving knowledge from other maps that have been lost to history. Now take a look at these two islands in the mid-Atlantic. We've got a spot-on depiction of South America, and yet there are two huge phantom land masses that we know for certain do not exist today. What the hell are those islands? Here's Google Earth's satellite view of the area described in the Piri Rice map. Here's the map overlaid on top of it. Now let's bring back the imaginary lines of ancient cosmic weirdness. Bam! Atlantis. Done. Thanks for your time. Dan's thing's a lot easier, isn't it? <laughs> All right, thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. These videos will be up on the Ignite Show and you should start one in your town. Take care. <laughs>